All right, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to week two of Introduction to Data-Centric AI. In today's lecture, we're going to cover three common problems present in real-world machine learning data sets, class imbalance, outliers, and distribution shift. Also, I'm hoping for this lecture to be really interactive, almost more like a discussion than a lecture. So please uh, feel free to, when I ask questions, just shout out answers to my questions. And please ask lots of your own questions as I go through this. I'm gonna, there's a lot of interesting material in this lecture. I'm going to try to get through all of it, but I'm going to go pretty fast. So ask questions whenever things are confusing. All right, so let's start with class imbalance. Just from this name, can anybody guess what class imbalance means? Why might class imbalance be a challenge? What is class imbalance? Yeah. Yeah, so those are two slightly different things. But yes, the, the first answer is the one we're going for here. And then the second thing we're going to talk about at the end of this lecture. So yeah, class imbalance is when certain classes in your data set are more prevalent than others. I think the canonical example of imbalanced classes is a fraud detection task. So banks deal with credit card transactions, and some of those transactions are fraudulent. And so they use machine learning to try to figure out which ones are fraudulent so they can block them so they don't lose money on those transactions. But it's not the case that fraudulent transactions are present at the same ratio as non-fraudulent transactions in real-world data. This might be as skewed as like 99.8% of transactions are benign, and only 0.2% are fraudulent. So can anybody think of any other examples of real uh, problems where there's class imbalance? Diagnosis. Yeah, exactly, uh, medical diagnoses. So if you're trying to say, predict the um, presence of a certain type of medical issue among the general population, like say a certain type of cancer, like most people don't have that cancer, and so there's gonna be a big imbalance between positives and negatives. Let's try to go for one more. Any other ideas? Yeah. Car crashes in car data. Sure, yeah, so car crashes in self-driving car data. So yeah, in general, self-driving cars might see a lot of different types of things on the road, and certain events on the road are less prevalent than others, right? Like self-driving cars probably see people changing lanes all the time or turning all the time, but crashes are hopefully a little bit more rare than those more common events. So uh, we talked about something really similar in a previous lecture. We talked about the topic of underperforming subpopulations. So does anybody know what the difference is between underperforming subpopulations and class imbalance? They're related topics, but not quite the same. So class imbalance is when there's a different prevalence of different uh, classes in the data set where classes are like the things we're trying to predict. Right, like with fraud detection, fraud versus not fraud. Whereas underperforming subpopulations is concerned with various slices of the data that don't line up with the classes. So for example, I think the medical diagnosis one is a really interesting example. So there's class imbalance there, like that's a challenge, but you might also have a problem with underperforming subpopulations. Like maybe in your data set, um, you do a better job of detecting a certain type of issue in men versus women, or with people of a certain race or something like that. So men versus women, that doesn't appear in the label, right? The label is just like positive or negative. Does someone have a certain type of issue? Um, but it may still be affected by these other slices of the data. All right, so what are some of the challenges with class imbalance? One of the first things that you run into is evaluation. We talked a little bit about this last lecture, but what might be the challenge with evaluating a machine learning model that you train on an imbalanced data set? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So the challenge is that just looking at standard evaluation metrics like accuracy may not make sense in these settings. So with fraud detection, if your metric is just accuracy and 99.8% of transactions are not fraudulent, then a classifier that always predicts not fraud, which is probably not what you want, is gonna have really high accuracy, right? So one of the first things you need to do when dealing with such a problem is define an appropriate evaluation metric for your problem. And there's no one size fits all solution there, but there are a couple different things you can consider. And one thing we'll talk about in this lecture is a score called the F beta score. So first a little bit of review, hopefully something you've covered in uh, 6036 or similar machine learning class. Can anybody tell me what these metrics are? Precision and recall? And here we're focusing on binary classification problems. So like the fraud detection example or the medical diagnosis example where we're trying to figure out if it's positive or negative. These are two metrics, kind of like accuracy is a metric. These are two other metrics that you might have studied before. So precision is looking at what proportion of things that were flagged positive are actually positive. So that's the true positive rate over the true positives uh, plus the false positives, right? Like all the things you flagged, what percentage of them are actually positive? And then the recall is what proportion of actual positives were identified correctly? So that's the true positives, uh, whoops. Uh, yeah, that's the true positives over the true positives plus false negatives, right? So. These are all the positive things, the ones you found and the ones you didn't find, and then these are the ones you found or flagged. So these are two different metrics you might be interested in. And when we're dealing with a binary classification problem where there's class imbalance, we might want to have a summary score or metric that we're trying to optimize that balances the trade-off between these two things. And so a common score to use there is, uh, does anybody know about this? You might have covered it before, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So one score you see that combines these two things is the F1 score, the harmonic mean of precision and recall. When dealing with imbalanced classes, a related metric that is useful is the F beta score. And so that's defined as, so it's uh, parameterized by this parameter beta. And it basically allows you to control the trade-off between precision and recall. All right, so here's the formula for F beta score. When beta equals one, then this just turns into your F1 score. And so to understand this a little bit better, let's think about a particular problem and think about how we might want to tune beta in order to choose an appropriate evaluation metric for our problem. So some of you are probably here at MIT over the last couple of years, and once COVID hit, MIT started regularly making people take COVID tests, right? And then if the test came out positive, you had to stay home and take your classes over Zoom for a week or something like that, right? And so those COVID tests aren't perfect, right? Like the COVID test itself has some false positive rate. And so if you don't have COVID, but you're flagged positive, it's gonna be kind of annoying for you because you're gonna have to stay home and take classes over Zoom, right? And so that's one possible bad outcome. The other possible bad outcome is a false negative, right? You might actually have COVID, but the test doesn't flag you as positive, and so you go into class, and uh, now you've gotten everybody around you sick. And so, does anybody have any idea, in that particular scenario, would you want to weigh precision or recall more heavily? Like, for that particular case, what's more problematic? Is it more problematic to stay at home when you don't need to, or is it more problematic if you miss a positive COVID case? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's probably more problematic to miss a positive COVID case. It's not too inconvenient to watch lectures from home. And so in that scenario, what, uh, what would you want to choose for beta? Like, would you want to choose one, something higher than one, or something less than one? So if you choose a bigger beta, that weighs precision uh, more heavily, right? Yeah. And yeah, so you'd want to yeah, optimize for having more false positives uh, for this particular problem. And in general, you, there's no one size fits all solution. So if you're applying this to say fraud detection or something, you'd need to actually understand like, oh, what are the costs of 
missing a fraudulent transaction, what are the costs of blocking a benign transaction, and yeah, there's some domain knowledge and understanding of the problem that's required there. All right, so once we have an evaluation metric, what do we do next? Well, we can train a machine learning model and evaluate it, right? And so one thing we could try on an imbalanced data set is just train a model in the standard way and just see how it does on the evaluation metric. And in some cases, it might just work out fine. And if that's the case, well, then you're done. Like, it does well on the evaluation metric. But if not, there are some techniques you can use to try to improve the performance on the evaluation metric you care about when dealing with heavily imbalanced data sets. What's kind of cool is a lot of these techniques are, they're pretty intuitive. So I'm sure you could figure out some of them uh, just on your own without even looking at the lecture notes. So you can think about that for a moment. We'll go through a couple of them right now. So just off the top of their heads, off the, off the top of your heads, can any of you just come up with some idea that might be a reasonable thing to try if you have class imbalance, like if you have this fraud detection data set? I think if you trained a classifier in the standard way, it would probably just predict not fraud. So what might you try to train a better classifier for your problem? Yeah? Yeah, so dropping out not fraud cases in your training set. And so that's a technique called undersampling. So this might seem a little bit weird. Like, you have a big data set, and now you're going to throw some of it away. But this actually works surprisingly well in practice for addressing this problem. Any, any other ideas? Yeah, exactly. Another idea is oversampling the minority class rather than dropping out examples of the majority class. And so, yeah, this works well in some settings. Um, and uh, yeah, it just depending on the application, you might need to be careful. Like, sometimes this works well, sometimes this can result in unstable training, so you might want to use different techniques. Any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah. You could create synthetic data for the underrepresented class. And so there's various data set augmentation techniques, right? Maybe you've studied ones related to images because those are very intuitive. If you have one image, then you can take that same image and rotate it or translate it or skew it or things like that just to get many more examples that still have the same label, but they're different examples. So it'll improve model training. Any other ideas? So another one that you might see sometimes is something called sample weights. And this one's, you can think of it almost like oversampling or related to oversampling and undersampling. But if you have a loss function that's the sum of per data point losses, instead of having your loss function just be the sum of your per data point losses, you can multiply it by sample dependent weights. And you can choose these weights so that you underweight the majority class or overweight the minority class. And so these three techniques are all related to each other. And you can think about on your own whether or not they're equivalent. And in some settings, they are. So like in linear regression, um, doing sample weights, say, like multiplying the weight of the minority class by two, is the same as oversampling by duplicating all those examples. But in other settings, they might not be exactly the same. Like say you're training a neural net with mini-batch gradient descent then the, it's not going to give you exactly the same results, though they're still related. And so speaking of neural nets, there's one other technique I'll briefly mention, which is balanced mini-batch training. And so this is when you're training a neural network or something like that, where you train in mini batches, so you're uh, doing training steps with a subset of your data at a time. And when choosing that subset of data, instead of sampling uniformly at random across the entire data set, 
you will weight uh, how you choose that data such that you will have an over-representation of the minority class. So say you can end up with 50-50 positives and negatives in the mini batch. And so again, these are very similar to these other methods we've talked about, like uh, weighting a minority class is similar to oversampling, but not quite the same, right? Like you won't end up with the same data point twice in a mini batch with this technique, whereas you might with oversampling. And uh, you can also, of course, combine these different techniques, and often a combination of this ends up working better in practice than any one technique on its own. All right, so that's our whirlwind tour of class imbalance. Any, any questions about that before we move on to outliers? Awesome. Well, let's move on then. Can anybody tell me, just informally, what is an outlier? You've probably heard the term before, an outlier, anomaly. Yeah, exactly. It's a data point that doesn't fit the distribution. It's a, it's a data point that doesn't look like the rest of the data. This is very easy to show in picture form. Like, OK, if I have some data, say it's two-dimensional data, so here's a x1 and x2 axis, and I have some samples here that are a negative class, some samples here that are a positive class, and then there's a positive example here. Just as a, as a human looking at this data, you can be like, oh, this thing is not like the rest. This is the outlier. So yeah, outliers are uh, data points that differ significantly from the other data points in your data set. How might, how might we end up with outliers in our data? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, bad sensors, that's one example. So we're say collecting data with an air quality sensor and it rained and the sensor is not super resistant to rain so the electronics are messed up and now it's giving us funny data. Any other ideas? Like gaps in data. Yeah, gaps in data, sure. For example, you might have missing fields in a tabular data set. So say you have a data set of student grades, and the TA just forgot to enter some of the grades, so they're just null values there. Any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah, it can be statistically significant depending on the problem. Uh, I'll summarize that or shorten that to just rare events. So notice that this is a little bit different than these two. Like, if we have outliers that are a result of bad sensors or gaps in data, like these we probably just want to st throw out. They're just nonsense. The gaps in data maybe we want to fix by filling in the missing fields, or if that's not possible, maybe it makes the most sense to drop them. But rare events, uh, those things we don't want to drop, right? Like your self-driving car data set, you maybe have some rare things going on. If you drop those, like you will not be able to handle those sorts of things in production, right? So. Any ideas how you distinguish between these and these? Is it possible to do automatically? Yeah, so that's part of the challenge with outliers is that it's not always the case that you can automatically tell whether or not a particular event or particular data point is a rare event or if it's bad data and what type of bad data it is. And so dealing with outliers often involves like one step, which is finding outliers, and then a second step, which is handling the outliers, and often that takes some extra work. It's not just an automatic thing, like throw them all away. Some of you have taken 6036. I think in that class you covered some techniques to deal with outliers, but those are very model-centric techniques, right? So you talked about how different loss functions might be more or less resistant to outliers, right? Like say using L1 loss versus L2 loss. So that's not what we're gonna do in today's lecture. We're gonna focus more on the data-centric side of outliers, and in particular, focusing on identifying outliers. I'm gonna be a little bit more precise uh, here in defining some terminology. There are a couple related problems in identifying outliers that have a slightly different setup, and it's, it's helpful to talk through them and understand what the difference is. Um, 
I've been using the term outlier more generally, and I will do so throughout the rest of the lecture, but for uh, the purpose of describing this task, the task of outlier detection is when you have an unlabeled data set, so there's just a bunch of data, and you want to figure out which subset of the data is out of distribution with the rest. So this might be like you just have a bunch of data points. I'm just going to draw these as Xs. There's no labels or anything like that. There's no notion of what is the clean data, what is in distribution data versus what is not. There's just a data set, and you want to figure out the subset of points that don't fit the rest. And then there's this related task of anomaly detection. So in anomaly detection, you're given the in distribution set separately. So you have. a bunch of data points xi that are defined to be in distribution. And now, given a new data point, say x star, you want to determine whether it belongs to this distribution or not. So you see how these two things are. They seem very similar, but they're slightly different problems. One question is to check your understanding is, how, what makes anomaly detection different from a standard supervised learning classification problem? Like, why is this not just binary classification? Like, given a data point, is it an outlier or not? Yeah? If we don't have exactly like a, a well known space that you want to be working in, like, given, given some X color, you wouldn't know what sort of things outliers at that point in the distribution would look like. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And I can, I'll try to make that a little bit more precise. In, in this setting, it's not like we have a set of in-distribution examples and a set of out-of-distribution examples, and we can use those to train on. It's not like we have labels associated with these, like all in-distribution and then like a bunch of extra stuff, which tells us what out-of-distribution data might look like. We only have the in-distribution set. And then given new data, we have to decide whether it belongs to that set or not. So they're slightly different problems. Yeah, okay, so I can, so what's the difference between anomaly detection and binary classification? And then like outlier detection. Oh, oh, okay, so between this and this. Yeah. yeah, so here you're given a set of data that's defined as the in-distribution set. You know all of it is in-distribution. So say you're trying to distinguish pictures of animals from pictures of non-animals. You might be given a data set that you're told, like, okay, this is all pictures of animals. And now I'll give you some random image that I found, find on the internet, and your task is to decide whether it's an animal. Is it like the things in this set or not? Whereas in this task, you're just given a data set, like here's a bunch of images. And I tell you which images are like most of the other images in the data set and which, is, which images are not. So it might be like I give you a, a data set of 95% animals, but there's some random garbage mixed in there. And you don't really have the, the, you can think of this as like a training set. You don't really have that in this setting. Yeah, so the question is, is outlier detection like a clustering problem? Uh, and yeah, clustering is one technique you can use to find outliers, yeah. And uh, you can also, there's, if you think about this, you can actually cast an anomaly detection problem as an outlier detection problem, because you could always just combine this data set with this data point, and then use an outlier detection algorithm to find the outliers, and then if this data point happens to be an outlier identified by this algorithm used here, then you can flag it as an anomaly. But uh, oftentimes, and depending on what you're doing, it probably makes sense to actually treat an anomaly detection problem as an anomaly detection problem, and there may be algorithms that perform better here, just like given that you, this is additional information that you have, right, that you don't have here. All right, any questions so far? All right, so let's get into the interesting stuff. How do you actually find outliers? And so there's tons and tons of research on this. I can't cover all the research. But we can talk through a couple different algorithms that you can use to find outliers. I'll go through some really simple ones, just so we can build up some intuition. And then after that, I'll describe some more practical ones. And this is a good part of the lecture to pay attention to, because the lab assignment is all about outliers. And I think we have a really fun lab assignment for today. All right, so um, mixing up my pages here.
All right, let's start really simple. Here's an algorithm. Uh, this is a simple method devised by John Tukey in 1977. This is one of the people who invented the fast Fourier transform, by the way, um, to identify outliers. And this is concerned with just real valued scalar data. Yeah, we can use this to build some intuition. All right, so suppose we have a bunch of data on the real line. I'm going to draw the data as just little lines here. So we might have some data spread out like this, whatever different you know, clusters of data. We can look at this and maybe look like, okay, it has some structure, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, there's some data. And what this algorithm does is it looks at the two quartiles. So it looks at basically, um, you, like, you sort the data and then you look at the, the lower quartile, this is Q1. Then you look at the upper quartile, this is Q3. Then this is defined, this range, the difference between them is the interquartile range. And then what you do is you look at a certain distance from each of these things. Suppose there's more data out here. Um, so maybe you want to look at 1.5 times the interquartile range on either side. And then these are your cutoffs. And then you say that this is in distribution and then anything below here or above here is out of distribution. All right, simple, heuristic way to find outliers. Another simple one, just continuing to build some intuition, is the z-score. This one people might have heard of. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody want to tell us what this is? Yeah. You, you, uh, Yeah, exactly. So the z-score is, for a particular data point i, is you take the data point, you subtract the, the mean, and you divide by the standard deviation. And then if your score is greater than some threshold, then you say that's an outlier. And this is often chosen as like some number like 3. And the idea here is that if your data is normally distributed, here I'm just going to draw data with uh, uh, mean of zero, and uh, if you look at standard deviations, one standard deviation, two, three, um, you're going to have, with normally distributed data, 99.8% of that in here, and then anything that's in this part or in this part, uh, you consider an outlier. Make sense? Yeah? Yeah, so uh, it depends on your data set. If you're dealing with non-normally distributed data, um, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Uh, it's like only valid to use with normally distributed data. And also, it usually only makes sense with low-dimensional data. Like, if you imagine applying, well, I guess either one of these techniques to, like, say, image data using just raw pixels as the values, like, you're not really going to get sensible results. Yeah. Um, is there an extension of the z-score to a mixture of Gaussian? So like, you can do the same thing in multiple dimensions, yeah. Uh, and so people do use these things in practice for, oh, another cool thing you can do with these is you also don't have to apply them to the entire data. One thing you can do is just look at individual features. So it might be that a particular feature has outliers in particular, uh, for a particular data set. So you could look at, say, a column of a tabular data set and apply this z-score technique and find outliers there. But yeah, so these are useful. It's simple data or tabular data are applied to individual features. And now we'll talk about a couple slightly more fancy methods. And again, this is kind of a random sample of outlier detection methods. There are lots of papers and like lots of algorithms implemented in uh, libraries like scikit-learn. And there's some links in the lecture notes that go into the details on those. So another uh, neat algorithm, this one's pretty simple to explain, is uh, intuitive and kind of interesting. It's something called isolation forest. So at a high level, or intuitively, the idea here is that if you have a random decision tree, then for 
uh, and then if you take all your data and you see like how far down the decision tree you need to go in order to end up with only that single piece of data isolated from the rest of the data, then the more outlier data, like the more the data is an outlier, the less down you'll need to go down your decision tree. Um, that might sound kind of confusing. It's probably easier if I just draw this out. So here we will consider two-dimensional data. So here's an x1 axis, here's an x2 axis, and I'm going to draw a bunch of data points as dots. Right, and so when we look at this, we're like, okay, there seem to be two clusters here and this one data point out here, that's an outlier, right? So how does isolation uh, forest automatically find this? Well, what it does, the algorithm at a high level is take the entire data set, choose a feature at random, choose a cutoff at random, and then make that uh, a decision boundary in your uh, decision tree. And so I'm gonna not choose these at random because I don't want to take forever to split this up. So I'll choose, suppose like, suppose you get lucky and we randomly choose like x2 equals 0 0.5 as one of our uh, boundaries. Okay, so now our decision tree is like x2 is less than 0 0.5. And then whatever, we might continue down. So maybe in this uh, branch of the decision tree, we might split x1 is less than 0 0.3 and continue going down here. But maybe in this part of the decision tree, we'll split on x1 is less than 0 0.7. And then you see how here in this part of the decision tree, that we've isolated one data point all by itself, right? Whereas you can see that here, it'll probably take longer to get down to just a single data point per tree node. And so at a high level, that's how the isolation forest algorithm works. So taking a step back, we might uh, think about how we could apply this to various data sets. You can think about how you could apply this to say a tabular data set, but would it make sense to apply this directly to say an image data set where uh, we're just working with raw pixel values as our uh, as our data, so we have lots and lots of features, like every axis is a pixel value or channel. Yeah, exactly. So it probably wouldn't, the answer is yeah, it probably wouldn't make that much sense, and you probably want to embed your image into a lower dimensional space where like, the, the place where the image ends up in that embedding space, um, yeah, it's actually like similar images are clustered near each other. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment after talking about one final algorithm that we're going to cover. And also note that so far, all the methods we've talked about basically end up assigning a score to each data point, right? Like here, the score for this data point is say two, because you have to go down two levels of the tree to isolate it, whereas the score for this data point here might be like four or something like that. Um, similar thing with the z-score and uh, even this thing, you have to choose a parameter for how many multiples of the interquartile range you want to consider as your in-distribution data. So at a high level, with all these methods, you end up with scores for your data points. And then in order to decide what are outliers, you have to choose a cutoff. You have to choose a threshold. And we'll, in a moment, talk about how you can go about doing that. One final method that I'll talk about for identifying outliers is looking at KNN distance. If you look at your data in feature space, similar setup as the last picture. We have a bunch of data points, a bunch of other data points, and some things that might be more like outliers. We can choose a KNN distance metric and a value for K, and then what we can do is assign a score to each data point by looking at its K nearest neighbors and computing just the average distance to those neighbors. And it's a pretty intuitive method, right? So if we look at this data point, for example, here's one of its closest neighbors, here's the second closest, here's the third closest, and so the mean distance is pretty small, right? But if we look at a data point that's an outlier, the mean distance is going to be a lot larger. And so here you need to do some things like choose a parameter for k and choose what your distance metric is. But then once you choose those things, you have a, a technique for scoring outliers. Any questions so far? Oh, actually, there's a third method I wanted to talk about that's actually really cool. So I will talk about that. Um, 
One final technique that you see being used sometimes is, uh, falls into the category of reconstruction-based methods. So has anybody heard of an autoencoder? I don't know if this is covered in 6036. Yeah, okay. Can somebody tell me what an autoencoder is? Yeah. Yeah, so an autoencoder maps a high dimensional input to a lower dimensional latent space, and ideally such that the different features are disentangled. And another part of the autoencoder, or part of how it's trained, is it can learn to map back from that latent space to the original uh, input space. And so you can have an autoencoder that, say, takes in an image, like a picture of a five. So this is. outlier detection using autoencoder reconstruction loss. So an autoencoder might take in uh, an image like a five, and now this is a model that transforms this into some low dimensional uh, latent space. This part's called the encoder. And then there's another part of the model that is called the decoder that can turn data in this low dimensional latent space back into data in the input space. And the idea with an autoencoder is you wanna be able to take data in your distribution, turn it into this low dimensional thing, but actually be able to reconstruct what you started with. So any ideas on how we might be able to use this for detecting outliers? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you feed in in-distribution images to your autoencoder, like encoder, decoder, pair, the whole thing, it's likely that what you start with and what you end up with look pretty similar. But if you feed it funny stuff that it's never seen before, it's likely that what you get out doesn't look quite as similar, say it's like blurry or something else is wrong with it, um, compared to what you started with. So like, say you're working with a data set that's handwritten digits, like MNIST. Oh, do you have a question? Uh, or, Yeah, so that's a great question. It's like, okay, we see how this can be straightforwardly applied. Actually, can I finish explaining that or drawing out the method first and then I'll answer your question. But yeah, the question was, how does this apply to outlier detection as opposed to this anomaly detection? But yeah, so suppose we train this on handwritten digits like MNIST and uh, so yeah, we have things like five and you pass it through, it still looks like a five. If you feed it funny out of distribution stuff, like maybe you have bad data that's a letter instead of an image, you feed in something that's like the letter I, capital I and you feed it through this autoencoder, latent representation, decoder. Oh, my drawing's getting sloppy. Decoder, and now it turns into something that looks kind of different. Maybe you get a one out or something, like these look kind of similar. It's like plausible that this would happen with an autoencoder. If you look at the reconstruction loss, so you use this when training the autoencoder in the first place. Like the way these are trained is you take this whole thing, you say, okay, I feed it data, this thing, and this thing should look similar. So you might use, say, L2 distance between the input and output. The L2 distance here is gonna be pretty small, whereas the L2 distance here, or whatever you're using for a reconstruction loss, is gonna be larger. And so you can use that to compute the score. So now going back to your question, like, okay, we see how we can use this for anomaly detection. Like, we train the autoencoder on the train set and then feed it stuff from well, for these, the new data we get and see what the reconstruction loss is. But this can also be applied to the problem of outlier detection. Like, if your data has mostly in distribution data and then some funny data, the representation that this learns will end up being such that you have lower reconstruction loss with your in distribution data compared to the out of distribution points. But yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Questions? Um, so the question is, what's the difference between the encoder and an autoencoder and kernel PCA? This is, uh, is it okay if we talk about that after the lecture? Yeah. A um, little bit less related to the problem of outliers and like how you can use generative models and their reconstruction loss as a score. 
And so you could also do this with different generative models, but this is just one example, and it's commonly used. All right, any more questions on outliers? Okay, so before we move on, I'll talk briefly about the lab assignment for today. So the lab assignment is entirely focused on outliers. And what we've done is we've made a data set for you. It's a data set consisting of a bunch of pictures of dogs. And then we, so that's our training data set. We're setting this up as an anomaly detection problem. So you have what dogs look like as input data. And then the goal is to, yeah, given fresh data, figure out if it's, uh, if it's an outlier or not. And so you, you'll explore a variety of techniques there. We've implemented some really simple baseline methods that work terribly for you. And the, we've given you some hints for how you might be able to implement something that's a little bit better. Um, one thing that we recommend you try is use a pre-trained model to compute embeddings for those images, and then use KNN distance as a metric. And that actually works surprisingly well on the data set used in the lab. So use a pre-trained model for what? Use a pre-trained model for computing image embeddings. Right, so you start off with these high dimensional images. Doing KNN distance in image space probably doesn't make that much sense. And so you use, say, a pre-trained model. Like you can find a pre-trained model on ImageNet or use Clip or one of the other transformer models or something like that. And we have links to those. And so you can just take the last layer or one of the penultimate layers of the neural net and just use that as the feature. Yeah. I don't know how much this is covered in a class like 036, but this is a super common technique. Like training models on large data sets is hard. It's super nice to be able to leverage pre-trained models. And then you can do lots of cool things with them. You can probably teach a whole class on this topic, like cool things you can do with pre-trained models. And uh, one final thing I'll just mention, and then you can explore this more in the lab, is, OK, these methods all give you scores. How do you actually evaluate how well the method does? So what you can do is plot how the true positivity rate, like for choosing different thresholds, how the true positivity rate varies with respect to the false positivity rate. Like basically, like how good is your method for various thresholds you choose? How much uh, actual outliers you identify compared to non-outliers? And you can plot that, and that gives you a curve. And if you, so you can compare the different curves for these uh, different methods you implement. And uh, another thing you can do if you want a single summary number is you can compute the area under that curve. And then you get one number that describes how well your outlier detection or anomaly detection is working. Awesome. Any other questions? All right, so one final topic we will talk about in today's lecture is distribution shift. So quick show of hands, who's heard this term before? Distribution shift or like covariate shift or one of those things? Okay, like a third of you or something. So this is actually, uh, this is very much a real problem that probably occurs in like every single machine learning task to varying degrees. And so, it is useful to understand it. So in this part of the lecture, we'll briefly talk about what is distribution shift, classifying distribution shift, and just talking through some examples, and then talking about how you can address this issue. Does anybody happen to know the definition of distribution shift by any chance? So distribution shift occurs when the joint distribution between inputs and outputs at test time, or sorry, yeah, at, well, at train time is not equal to the joint distribution of inputs and outputs at test time. And we'll break this down and look at different classes of this happening. But even before we dive into that, you can intuitively see why this could be problematic, right? Like if you do machine learning on one distribution and then deploy your model in a setting where there's a different distribution, you might not expect that the model would work particularly well, right? 
one type of distribution shift you might see is something called covariate shift or data shift. And that occurs when the distribution of inputs varies between train and test. Also, when I say train and test, is it clear that this is like you train a model and then you deploy the model? It's not like you're just evaluating a model where you have all the ground truth here. It's like you train your self-driving car on some data and then you go evaluate your self-driving car and like you don't want it to crash and kill somebody. Um, so covariate shift is when your input distribution is mismatched between train and test. But uh, when... Right. So when your input distribution changes, but the relationship between inputs and outputs does not change between train and test. And so this is a lot easier to understand with a picture. So I will draw one for you now. Here we're looking at a very simple uh, regression problem. Like predict y given x. And suppose we have some training data. I'm going to draw this as circles that looks like, say, something like this. Then we train a model on this data, and the model we end up with might look something like this. Right? And it's like data's going up. Model predicts like when x goes up, y goes up. But it might be that when we actually deploy this model in production, the inputs we see in practice in the real world are a little bit different than the, the inputs we've seen here. Like maybe what we see in, in practice, and I'll draw these as x's. So again, these are x's and dots are train versus test in this picture. Before I've used different symbols to indicate different classes. That's, what's, that's not what's going on here. So we might have some, some data here, but maybe there's extra um, data points at test time that actually look more like this. Maybe this came from a, a, like, this is the function we've learned, but the true function actually looks kind of like this, right? But at test time, we only saw inputs here, and so the model we, we learned is very different than the, than the true function. Does that make sense? I think this one's pretty easy to come up with examples for. So you can think about examples for a moment while I erase this board. And then we'll talk through some. Uh, Can you think of any situations in the real world where you might have different looking data at training time versus deployment time? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat that? I didn't like, quite catch it. Like, you have like, some news search engine. Mm -hmm. Questions asked about news, like people looking up news in the past would be different in the future. Sure, yeah. So the, uh, I'll repeat it for the microphone. If you have a news search engine and you're trying to rank the, or say, predict something about the, the questions people ask, the questions people ask at one point in time might look different than the questions people ask at a different point in time. And this is an instance of a more general pattern where just the distribution of data is time varying. Any other, uh, any other ideas, for examples? You can also think of really concrete examples. Yeah? Looking at x ray images, like what you train on might be different than what people use in the model. Sure. Uh, looking at x ray images, what you train on might, be look different, might look different than what you evaluate on. 
So I'll try to make that a little bit more concrete or precise. Maybe you have a data set that comes from a particular type of x-ray machine, like a particular brand. And so now your input data distribution has a present in it quirks of that particular x-ray machine. So maybe this is you like train on a data set that came out of MGH and they have a particular brand of x-ray. And then you go to deploy this in hospitals all across the world and everybody uses different x-ray machines and those quirks are gonna be different for those different x-ray machines. And so now you have this yeah, distribution mis mismatch between your input and output. Let's try to go for one more. Any other ideas? Was that a hand? No. So the question is, what's the uniqueness or like, what's the difference between covariate shift and just distribution shift in general? So again, it's in particular looking at situations where the relationship between inputs and outputs doesn't change, but the distribution of inputs does. Um, and so, uh, I can try to come up with a, an example that's more clear. Um, uh, and also, in the same uh, example, I'll just give you another example of covariate shift. Um, if you have a self-driving car and it's trained on the sunny, sunny streets of San Francisco, so all the data it's seen is like sunny streets, no bad weather, and then you go and deploy it in Boston on a snowy day like today, you could imagine that you might have some problems, right? And the reason this is covariate shift and there's no change in the relationship between inputs and outputs is like the way you should be driving given some particular conditions outside doesn't change, right? Like you drive a certain way in the snow, you drive a certain way in dry weather. It's just that your training data didn't have any snowy driving conditions, but at evaluation time you have to deal with them. But yeah, it's the, these can be a little bit confusing because oftentimes you, well, you can have both, or you can have like distribution shift in general that's not like just a uh, covariate shift. And we'll get into that. Oh. Sorry, I think I, like, I think I as far as I understand, there is some like, there is some like natural, like present relationship, right? But, uh, and it's like always there, right? But, mm -hmm. uh, but then sort of like, for example, the way that we uh, measure it changes a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where that happens, right? Yeah. So would collecting more and varied data during training time resolve covariate shift? Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, it's like do, will collecting more and varied data during training time resolve this problem? And like the answer is yeah. Like that's a very common way of addressing it. In certain situations, you can get around the issue without collecting more data, but that can be a little bit tricky. Yeah. So like your self-driving car, once you train it in San Francisco, like maybe get some uh, data from snowy roads as well, and then it'll probably do better. Any other questions? So one other type of shift I'll talk about in this lecture is something called concept shift. And just given what we've been do talking through so far, can anybody guess what this means? Or what it's defined as? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's when your probability of y given x is different at train time versus test time. Uh, and I'll add in the last part. Uh, 
So the relationship between inputs and outputs actually changes between train and test time, but the distribution of inputs themselves does not change. So this one's a little bit less intuitive, or at least I find it less intuitive. And it's also something that's actually harder to deal with in practice. So to get a, some intuition for how this is or what, uh, how this works, um, I will draw another picture. So suppose we have some data here. Uh, in this example, we're going to have a two-class classification setting. So these are two feature axes, and I'm going to draw the different classes as pluses and minuses. So say we have some positive data here and some negative data here. And then this might be the boundary between them. And this is the situation at training time. But what if at testing time, this boundary actually changes? Like all the data, okay, so I'm not touching any of the data points. They're staying in the same space. But maybe this boundary like, looks like this now. And these all become positives at test time. So right, p of x hasn't changed. I haven't moved any of the input data points. It's actually the exact same distribution but I've changed the relationship between input and output, because now these things are positive when they were negative before. So I found it a little bit tricky to come up with examples for this, but let's try to, uh, I have a couple in the lecture notes, and we can try to talk through it together. Um, I think oftentimes you have situations where there is concept shift, but also like it's really hard to find situations where the input data distribution does not change at all between train and test. So the examples I came up with do have some uh, covariate shift as well. But yeah, while I'm erasing this board, you can think about if you can come up with any examples of concept shift. So again, this is where the relationship between inputs and outputs changes at training time versus test time. Yeah, so for example, if we change the labels of some class, yeah. Can anybody come up with any more concrete examples? Yeah, I guess if you had a, like a, a vinyl uh, output record, and you had people rate the songs at some point in time, and at another point in time, the songs would be played with the same frequency at over time, so people might rate them differently at different times. Yeah, OK, so. Yeah, yeah. So this is another kind of funny time varying thing. But rather than a time varying input distribution, it's a time varying change in the relationship between input and output. So we might have as our inputs x or the yeah the inputs might be just songs themselves, raw songs, and the songs themselves don't change over time. Like a, the song is the song, but it might be the case that people rate the songs differently in 1980 versus 2023. Yeah. Um, also, it's it's like at test time we actually don't we don't have the labels, right? It's just like what does the model end up doing when it's deployed or in the real world? Uh, can you can you repeat that? So for um, for the ground truth of the data set, we have overlapping parts of the data for the classes. Mm -hmm. During training, uh, during data collection, for training, we only collected like parts of the data that's not overlapping. Yeah. Okay. So maybe at training time, we have we're careful to not collect examples where they're overlapping classes. But at evaluation time, we might have samples which belong to multiple classes. I think that's uh, an example of covariate shift, right? It's like Maybe you know, say a data set like ImageNet, we're careful to only collect, say, a baseball or a baseball glove. But, and so the model's only seen those things at training time. But at deployment time, there are a lot of pictures of baseballs in baseball gloves. Um, so the input distribution is changing there, right? Or I, I got an example. So like there's like an app that uh, lets you read about your favorite like, uh, celebrities and stuff like this, right? Mm -hmm. and 
Yeah. Sure. So I'll, I'll repeat that for the microphone. Maybe you're predicting the popularity of celebrities based on some, uh, some features. And it might be the case that some celebrity does something unreasonable, and now people don't like them anymore. And so maybe the input data that you're using to predict the celebrity's popularity itself hasn't changed, but the, the way people think about the celebrity has changed. And I'll, I'll give one final example, uh, one that I like. And this is like a super real world example. Um, This is related to stock prices. So you know, lots of people train financial machine learning models, right? It's a popular thing to do. And one thing you might try to do is predict a company's stock price based on some fundamentals about the company, right? So like companies have various statistics that you can look at, like how, much they, like how much they profit every year, how much revenue they have every year. So one particular thing you might look at, and one thing a lot of investors look at, is something called the uh, earnings per share. Right? Like the company makes a certain amount of money. There are a certain number of shares that have been issued. How many dollars does the company make in earnings per share? Right? That's like one reasonable metric for measuring the health of a company. And so our x might be our earnings per share. And for y, we might look at the stock price. And we're trying to maybe have some other features, but yeah, let's say simple setting where we're trying to predict stock price based on earnings per share. Um, what's kind of interesting, so th this um, ratio, this x to y, or like uh, earnings per share over stock price, is something called the PE ratio. The price to earnings ratio. It's a number that a lot of people look at. And what's kind of interesting is that this has changed over time. So, like for example, I, I looked this up for the S&P 500 companies in 1975. So, in 1975, this was uh, 8.3, and in 2023, this is like about 20. So, the relationship between X and Y has actually gone up. Like the way people value a company. Like companies are a lot more highly valued now for making the same amount of money compared to like what are 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So this is a and yeah, it's probably the case that earnings per share over all the companies has also changed over time, right? Like companies change, like things have changed a lot since 1975, but this relationship itself has also changed, and so I think this is a pretty clear example of concept shift. So yeah, these things happen in the real world. What do you do about them? I think we had one suggestion already, which is, oh, when you notice this happening, maybe you try to figure out, um, so you have covariate shift, and you're trying to figure out, okay, like what input data do I have at test time that I'm missing at training time? You can go out and collect more data. But before we talk about addressing distribution shift, let's look at some ways of detecting it. Does anybody have any ideas? So again, the setting here is like you train a machine learning model on some data, and then you've gone and deployed it in the real world. It's not like you have a test set on your laptop and you actually have the ground truth of the labels. Yeah? What you can do is you have uh, anomaly detection where you have your old data and your baseline not anomalous data, and then you have your data as uh, what you're testing for anomaly. Yeah, yeah, so you can apply anomaly detection. Um, you can look at the distribution of your, so this is particularly useful for uh, seeing if you have covariate shift at, uh, at deployment time. You can take the data you had at training time, and, like train an anomaly detector on it, and then apply that at inference time. You can see like, okay, is this data point anomalous? And then you might be able to, yeah, you'll have to figure out how to handle that action. Like maybe you don't trust the output of your model as much if you think the data point is an anomaly or something like that. But yeah, more generally, One thing you can do, and you can look in the lecture notes for like specific examples of this, but one thing you can do is monitor your, the data itself at, de at deployment, like in your deployment setting, and yeah, apply things like anomaly detection to see if there's been distribution shift. Can anybody figure out what word I'm going to write here? You can monitor your data, or you can monitor your model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so and especially if you can find good metrics for model performance, um, you can also look at those at deployment time and keep a close eye on them and see how they change over time. So going back to some of the early um, examples we talked about in this lecture, like fraud detection, there's like, some really great metrics there that you could look at at, uh, at runtime or at, uh, at deployment time, right? Like you could just look at how many dollars you lose per day to fraud. And like, if that's going up by a lot, like something is wrong and you need to address it, right? Or like self-driving cars, if your cars start crashing a lot more, something needs to be done. Um, and there, there are a variety of metrics you could look at um, for your model. And then as far as uh, addressing distribution shift, this is a kind of advanced topic. We won't go too much into detail there. But uh, yeah, one of the things that was proposed was once we notice this is a problem, we can collect more data and then retrain our model to address the shift. So it's, that's uh, one, one approach you can use. All right, so that's all I have to say on distribution shift. So. That is it for today's lecture. Um, if there are any final questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Otherwise, I will, or we will see you tomorrow for a lecture on active learning.